Welcome everybody. My name is Laura Lee Cascada and I'm the campaigns director with the Better Food Foundation. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to this webinar on citizen advocacy and how you can get started uh, crafting plant-based, plant-forward policies in your community. And we know that animal agriculture is a huge contributor to the climate crisis, which is why we're all here. Um, their emissions account for nearly 15% of all emissions matching vehicular contributions. And that's according to a recent Chatham House report. And the authors of that report, interestingly, also spotlight a key ingredient in sparking a shift away from our meat heavy diet. And that is that there's a general belief that it is the role of government to spearhead efforts to address unsustainable consumption of meat. So ultimately we as citizens depend on our leaders to model and usher sustainable eating into our communities. And citizen activists have heard that call to action. They've begun urging decision makers in their cities from coast to coast and globally to bring about plant forward policies to the table and help reshape our food norms. So as we at the Better Food Foundation started to dig into this work uh, through our own program, which is called Default Veg, which you'll hear about more later in this presentation. And the idea of Default Veg is that it's a simple strategy of defaulting menus to plants and allowing folks to opt in to meat or dairy, basically flipping the script on the current food norm. So as we dug into this work, we discovered that people all over the country and the world were already making huge strides. And so we wanted to tell their stories and empower others like those of you in the audience to join them, whether you're working actually within city government or you're just an activist on the ground and want to get more active in your community and making this change. So like I said, we have a really packed schedule. So we're packing in a lot to a very short time. We won't have a lot of time for questions at the end. So if there's something that you wanna know more about and your question doesn't get answered, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll collect them all. Also, we will be sending out the uh, recording afterwards along with a lot of information about how to get involved in these different programs, how to contact the panelists, all of that good stuff. So if you, you know, just, have a burning question that doesn't get answered, feel free to um, get it answered through email after that. And so without further ado, I am really excited to hand it over to Naja Wright Brown as our moderator today. She has a prolific background in community organizing and advocacy. She received her MBA from the University of Phoenix and later became the co-creator of Vegan Soul Fest and Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week, which have won her numerous awards, including Baltimore Business Journal's 2021 Enterprising Women Award. Nija is also the executive director of the Black Veg Society, which promotes plant-based eating and veganism through edutaining programming and events. She runs a digital talk show, Nija Speaks, that helps people find their vegan soul and gives back to small businesses and individual advocates. Between all these ventures, she's also the managing partner of an award-winning vegan soul food restaurant called The Land of Kush, which was recognized as TripAdvisor's Trip Advisors 2021 Best of the Best Vegan Restaurants in America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. You, you took half of my uh, overview away, so now I'm not going to know what to talk about. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? I hope you're well. I'm going to uh, just basically run through uh, some of the events that um, uh, Laura was was talking about. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to share my screen. I uh, did this presentation for Pro Veg International uh, uh, last year, and um, I think it's a, a lot good information to share. So again, Chloe did a good job of uh, telling you what I what I'm what I am and what I do. So I co-own the Land of Coach with my husband Gregory Brown. We're celebrating 11 years. So when we're talking about food policy, you know that might not be something that we're doing with government. But I always say that if you want to um, instill or get people to do things, mandates 
you know, you have to mandate things. So people, the people on the panel, some of them have been doing that and it is great work. But what we're doing in Baltimore is basically we're just selling vegan food, you know, and that's the start. That's opening the dialogue. Um, and, and that helps a lot because over the 11 years, we have built very strong relationships in the community of Baltimore, in the state of Maryland, in different uh, states across the nation. So again, Vegan Soul Fest alone recognized, uh, we were recognized as a best food festival finalist in the FX 2018 uh, conference, which is amazing. It was only five festivals and <laughs> we were one of them. So, and now we're currently in Vegan Restaurant Week, which is expanded into a month because of the demand. So that's the role that I play in event organizing and trying to bring uh, plant-based food, vegan food to the market. And, and it is it is a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy. It's uh, not for the faint of, at heart. You know, if your purpose is to do this to be an advocate, you know you have to you know go go with it all the way and with with your full heart. Because I can tell you many times I have stayed up hours and hours and hours. Um, so again, but it's well it's well worth the work. So let me just show you a couple of things here. So with Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week, um, we have meat heavy restaurants participating. So restaurants that may have not even thought about putting plant-based options on the menu, putting options on the menu. So, and that's just through a really simple vegan restaurant week. Uh, and we get a lot of media and press coverage for that. Really, really simple to do in my world. Uh, and then with Vegan uh, Soul Fest, New York Times has uh, wrote an article about Black vegans stepping out for their health and other causes. Why is this significant? Because right now it's known that uh, Black vegans are, um, you know, leading the charge in the vegan movement. So this is very important. So to be in the New York Times and for this to come out and to talk about the festival attracting well over 8,000 people in, in 2018, it was 16,000 and it continues to grow and grow. This is very important. So we're reaching the masses, vegan, veg curious, uh, people that never thought about going vegan, it's very important. Uh, and then just little festivals and even awarding people that are doing great things like uh, Tracy McWhorter, who's doing the 10 million black vegan woman initiative this year, you know, stemming from the 10,000 black uh, vegan woman initiative. So we can go on and on. I love what I do as an event organizer. Um, I partner with many organizations such as uh, uh, the, the Meatless Monday organization, John Hopkins uh, Center of a Livable Future, um, just, just so many. And I would love to connect with uh, all of you and talk about uh, the things that I do. Uh, again, um, the last thing that I worked on was a coalition with uh, the next person that I'm going to introduce. And I can tell you, I have been down to Annapolis to testify and it is no easy task, but the work has to be done. And the person that I'm going to introduce, she is doing the darn thing. So <laughs> without further ado, let me um, introduce uh, the next guest. Next panelist, give me one second. Um, Chloe Warman is the Senior Program Manager for Friends of the Earth's Climate Friendly Food Program, where she leads campaigns to advance a healthy and climate friendly food system. On Capitol Hill, in state houses, and across city governments, she has pioneered climate friendly food procurement policies, initiatives to expand plant based school meal offerings, and other policies to build a just and sustainable food system. Chloe holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Environmental Studies and Philosophy from Lewis and Clark College and a Master's degree in Applied Economics from the University of Maryland. She currently resides in Prince George's County, Maryland, where she serves as co-chair for the Prince George's County Food Equity Council. Thank you for attending. Chloe, please take it away. Thanks so much, Nija. Um, couldn't have asked for a better introduction. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to share um, my screen here and um, confirm that y'all can see this. Can I get some nods? Um, do you see it? Okay, great. 
So my presentation is focused on citizen advocacy for healthy and climate friendly food policies in your city or county. Um, as Nigel mentioned, um, I work with Friends of the Earth and I work at the intersection of diet, climate and public health um, to shift menus at the state level, at the federal level, at the city and county level and also in school districts um, toward more plant-based foods and fewer animal products as both a climate and a public health solution. So at Friends of the Earth, instead of um, talking about plant-based, uh, we usually come in with a frame of talking about healthy and climate-friendly. With plant-based or plant-forward, meaning plant-predominant, mostly plants, a small amount of animal products being the core component of that. So I don't think I need to tell uh, the folks attending this call about the major impact that animal agriculture has and the, the number one thing we can do in terms of getting measurable emissions reductions on menus is to shift toward more plant forward menus. But we at Friends of the Earth also think it's really important uh, to support organic agriculture and to reduce food waste, uh, which are both really important for the climate and also have important um, social justice elements to them as well. So know that when I say healthy and climate friendly or climate friendly, um, this is the framework that we're using. So, the purpose of this presentation is to um, under, you know, to emphasize what Laura said, that cities and counties have a major role to play when it comes to food policy, and that you as citizen advocates um, have an important role to play in shaping their policy. So why cities? Why look at cities if your goal is around, you know, meat reduction and reducing the climate impacts associated with livestock? One is just the amount of influence cities have over food um, and counties as well. They have purchasing, they can have tax incentives, they can do public outreach and promotion. A city could do its own vegan restaurant week, similar to what um, Nigel has been doing in Baltimore. A uh, city could uh, put mandates on businesses. They could require like licensed hospitals to provide a plant-based option. And I'll talk more about the range of policies, but they have a lot of power. Um, purchasing, I think, being uh, the one that we focus on a lot at Friends of the Earth and below this, um, on this slide, you'll see a list of some of the types of facilities that cities or counties purchase food for, and then a guide that Friends of the Earth created for city and county staff on how to implement a climate-friendly food purchasing policy. The second reason to look at cities is that cities are often climate leaders, um, and uh, for a lot of cities, they are just not accountable to the same industrial agriculture lobbying interests that you'll see at the state level um, or at the federal level. You know, Los Angeles doesn't have a whole lot of, um, you know, CAFOs in it, and so those CAFO operators don't have relationships uh, with the county commission. They don't have relationships in city hall, but you do, which is the third point, or you will um, after hearing this webinar and getting started with your advocacy, is that you're there. So you can have a lot of influence as a constituent in a city that you live in or that you have you know, some kind of footprint or stake um, in. Again, this can be, we're talking towns, you know, co communities, uh, counties, all sorts of um, political jurisdictions. So one type of facility that you may have noticed was not included on my last slide is schools. And we keep schools separate. Schools are a super high impact place for change. In any given city or county, the school district is most likely a larger purchaser of food than any other city or county facility is. But schools are typically governed differently. So while you would go to your city council members to make changes to the food that your city is procuring for, say, a city building, you would likely go to the school board um, and to you know a school superintendent for schools. There are some exceptions to that where cities or counties do have more control over the school system, like in Washington, D.C. and New York City. But I wanted to point folks toward these resources if you're interested in making change in your school uh, in particular, especially if you have a child, a grandchild, niece or nephew, um, that gives you an important um, in with school leadership around menus. So this is one example from Oakland Unified School District in California. Um, and again, I think we you can still use this as evidence to point to these, what we call the quadruple benefit of climate-friendly food when you're working with cities and counties. 
So Oakland reduced um, some of the animal products on its menu over a period of two years, and they were able to achieve a 14% reduction in their carbon footprint, which was equivalent to installing 87 solar systems installed on their roof. And if they had done that, um, if they had done that instead to achieve these same carbon footprint savings, it would have cost millions of dollars. But instead, they were actually able to save money that they invested in um, purchasing higher quality food, um, improving student satisfaction. And even on top of that, they still saw savings in their pockets of $42,000 a year. So this is a really compelling case study, I find, with city leadership because they're really looking for ways that they can be leaders on climate without necessarily having to spend a lot of taxpayer dollars, and this is a good solution for them. This graphic just illustrates the, the power of even one recipe swap in a school district. I think pro providing this type of data to demonstrate we're not talking about completely removing meat from the menus, um, but look, just one recipe swap made you know, a few times a year uh, over a long period can result in major carbon savings. So now I'm going to move into um, uh, some examples of some policies that you could look at for um, cities and counties. And, um, and then at the end, I'll talk about some general advocacy tips and some different pathways for you to consider. But I wanted to provide some examples first. So I'm sure many folks on the call are familiar with the Good Food Purchasing Program. Um, at Friends of the Earth, we kind of think of this as like the gold star, comprehensive, values-aligned procurement policy. So this is a flexible framework where schools, institutions, um, universities, it's open to a number of types of institutions, um, improve their procurement in these five different value categories that are listed on this slide. And one of the ways that you can essentially earn points in the categories around um, humane uh, food and um, environmentally sustainable food is by reducing meat and dairy in favor of adding more plant-based options to menus. So this that's one pathway uh, that, that um, institutions that have adopted this program are using, and this may be a good fit for your city or county, especially if you want to team up and partner with folks that have other interests like around racial justice and promoting local foods. Um, another example of a policy that you can kind of piggyback onto if you're doing local level advocacy is the Cool Food Pledge. Um, the Cool Food Pledge uh, helps institutions to achieve a goal of reducing the emissions associated with the food they purchase by at least 25% by the year 2030. Um, and the primary strategy for doing this is to shift away from animal-based foods toward more plant-based foods. Um, and I can put the link in the chat after I'm done presenting where you can see all of the institutions that have adopted the Cool Food Pledge. Um, and cities can adopt this too. Several European cities have, and New York City um, became the first U.S. city to formally join the Cool Food Pledge recently. In Washington, D.C., uh, where I, I live just outside of Washington, D.C., we took the model of the Cool Food Pledge and we said, let's actually mandate this. Let's do more than just, you know, have a pledge to do this. Let's put this into the law. And so we passed a law um, that adopts the same goal as the Cool Food Pledge, but that requires DC to meet those goals, but also to create best practices and to hire staff to support different agencies in shifting their menus, to provide that kind of technical assistance and advice. Okay, how do you effectively menu plant-based options? And how do you do that effectively for the different types of settings that are addressed? One last example before I um, go into the advocacy tips is where I live in Prince George's County. Um, one of the things that I found from working on uh, city and, and county climate-friendly food purchasing policies for about four and a half years now is that it is so helpful if you are in the place where you're trying to pass the policy. Um, so in Prince George's County, I was part of um, the Prince George's County um, Schools Climate Action Plan Committee, and I weighed in with the Prince George's County Climate Action Planning Committee for the county, along with the food, our Food Equity Council, uh, which I serve on as well. And this was like one of the easiest wins. Like all we did was submit some comments. We knew when the Climate Action Plan was coming. We submitted some comments about the importance of addressing the connection between diet and climate change, and to include some recommendations, including that Prince George's County pass a policy similar to D. 
CDCs to set a goal around reducing its food related greenhouse gas emissions. And it ended up in our climate action plan. So that's not climate action plans typically aren't binding. I'll talk about that a little more in a second, but it's a great way to kind of pave the way for these policies. Um, and it's maybe an easier lift and an, an excellent way to connect with other people in your jurisdiction that also care about climate change and make sure they understand the connection with, between diet and climate change as well. So I wanted to end with um, some advocacy tips and then uh, a summary of some of the different types of policies you can consider. So first, find some other citizen allies. You know, we're stronger in numbers. Find some friends. Uh, do, you, do you have a food policy council in your county? Do you have um, a chapter of an organ of a Sierra Club chapter? You know, reach out to some of the organizations and groups that might be allies for you in the community and approach decision makers together. You also want to find a champion in government. This is so important. And this could be a, a variety of people. This could be a city council member that cares or a county commissioner. It could be a staff person of one of the city council members. It could be someone in the city sustainability office um, that you know cares about this issue or that could be made to care about this issue. Um, you know, you can look for someone, maybe there's a um, uh, somebody who sets the menus that is a nutritionist and they really see the value of uh, plant-based nutrition. So find your stakeholder, find your champion in government. I want to talk about consulting with stakeholders, you know, especially stakeholders who are impacted by city and county food service. And this is particularly important for any institutions that um, have that are serving people that are really dependent on that food. So that would be uh, places where people are getting like long term medical care um, in a city or county funded health care facility and also correctional facilities. Working in correctional facilities is really tricky. Um, it's you cannot do it without consulting with the groups that are working on improving the carceral system um, in your jurisdiction and really making sure that you have the input and buy-in of uh, people who are incarcerated. So I wanted to put that flag because I know a lot of people look to prisons. They can be a really good, good place to look. The food environment in prisons is a crisis and needs to be addressed, um, but it's a more comprehensive problem. So you have to tread um, delicately. You want to identify your goal and your pathway, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Identify your messaging points. You know, are you talking to somebody that's a climate champion? Is health the best angle? Is cho consumer choice the best angle? We have so many reasons why plant -based, adding more plant-based foods is beneficial, so choose a strategic reason. Um, take advantage of the existing resources and support from national organizations. Like, don't do this by yourself. There are so many organizations um, you know, Better Food Foundation is one. I know Mercy for Animals. There are other groups that are working at the city and county level. So maybe if you are one of those groups um, and you're from a national organization and you're in a position to kind of provide assistance to individual advocates, um, maybe share that in the chat right now just so folks know uh, some of their resources. You want to be persistent, um, keep following up, but don't burn bridges, and then follow up on implementation. So that goes back to like that climate action plan example. I can't say, oh, great, got that in the climate action plan, I'm done, because that doesn't really have an effect on policy. I've got to follow up, got to get a pol formal policy in place, and then have to make sure that it's implemented, which takes years, you know, really following up on it. The DC bill that I mentioned, I started working on that issue probably four years ago where, you know, and it's going to take another, you know, all the way up till 2030 to really be focused on effective implementation. So my last slide, I just wanted to leave you with some ideas of potential policy goals um, and how to pass them. So these are just some of the ideas you'll probably hear other ideas from other presenters. But you can look at policies like we mentioned in DC that track and reduce emissions from food purchases, or you could look directly at reducing the volume of animal products purchased. Uh, we meant Laura talked about the default veg catering policy. You could uh, re require veg options to be available at public facilities. Um, look at nutrition standards. You know, better aligning um, public food menus with the dietary guidelines will likely result in um, fewer animal products consumed since we're over consuming meat and dairy. Um, a comprehensive values based procurement policy. Uh, you can look at city sponsored public awareness campaign. You could try to get an acknowledgement of the GHD emissions from livestock in your um, climate action plan. And then to the right here are some 
ideas of how to actually do this. You know, do you want to do a standalone policy? Your city probably has a green purchasing policy, something like prioritizing energy efficient light bulbs. Is there a way to prioritize procurement of plant-based foods through that policy? Um, we talked about climate action plans. There might be food or wellness policies or nutrition standards for city or county meetings. And then consider whether you want to do an executive order, something from the administrative branch, something that the count, the, the council or the commission passes. Do you want to, is there a way to incorporate it into an existing policy or maybe look at a non-binding resolution like declaring, you know, Green Mondays or joining the, um, the, um, there's different international food pledges as well um, that cities can join that can help pave the way for these policies. So I know that's a ton of information. There's a lot out there, but hopefully um, folks will pipe up in the chat of where uh, they're able to help uh, through their organizational resources. And, and we are too at Friends of the Earth. So with that, um, just thank you. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to Nigel. Thank you so much, Chloe. Yes, I want to be like you when I grow up. You're definitely working hard. I gotcha. I can tell you, I, Chloe, I don't even remember how we connected, or but I know, I guess it was about some food, you were doing a food policy thing down in Annapolis, and I do remember that, and you ordered some food from Land of Kush, if I'm not mistaken. Um, key things that Chloe mentioned, that collaboration ally, it, it, it pays for itself, very important. Um, championing government, yes, make sure that your council person, uh, you know, you go all the way up to the lieutenant governor, the governor if you can, but, you know, local council person should know exactly what you're doing, make sure you have good relationships with them and the resources existing. I hate recreating stuff. If you go to blackvegsociety.org, it's a lot of people that I already work with. I don't got to recreate things, um, makes things simple. And um, being persistent, Chloe, yeah, <laughs> very persistent in getting things done with all the emails and the meetings that are on time and end on time. And don't burn bridges, very important because it's a small circle. You never know, you know, <laughs> that relationship gets severed and, and then later on you're, you're regretting it. And follow up, yeah, when you do something, you know, what, what, what's happening? You know, did it work, did it not work? You definitely want to follow up on whatever you're doing, projects, making laws, policy. So thanks again, Chloe. And we're going to move on to um, our next panelist, uh, Nilan Gore, uh, is a senior scientist in the field of genetic disorders and holds a master's in science in cellular, cellular and molecular biology. Nilong also founded Cultivate Empathy for All, an organization which promotes empathy as a tool to address global challenges. As a systems thinker, he believes that we live in a highly interconnected ecosystem where our well-being is interdependent on fellow humans, non-human animals, and the environment. He mobilizes community members to educate their city lawmakers on the negative impacts of animal-based food systems on various aspects of our society and environment and promote local sustainable policies and programs. Thank you, Helan, to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, can I go ahead and share my slides? Absolutely. Okay. Can you all see my slides? I okay. sure can. Perfect. Awesome. Um, hello and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time today uh, to attend this webinar. Um, I also want to actually thank Better Food Foundation for giving me an opportunity to talk about my work um, in the Berkeley. I started working on the plant-based food policies um, after my friend uh, Aldo came to my life. Um, I grew up in a Hindu family back in India and I always was against animal cruelty, but Aldo really helped me cultivate empathy for all of our animals. Um, and after that, um, it wasn't enough for me just to be a vegan. I wanted to actually step up and do more for billions of lives that's actually suffering in this country in the name of food. So I started reading and researching about the animal factory farming. 
And soon I realized that animal agriculture is not only responsible for animal cruelty, but it is also associated with several aspects of our society and environment. And at that time, I decided to start working on plant-based food policies right here in Berkeley. Now, as many of you know, Berkeley has a long history of adopting progressive environmental policies. And so that's why I decided to actually focus my advocacy on a climate change and then later on help Berkeley Council connect dots between the rest of the other issues that are associated with animal agriculture. First of all, I actually looked at Berkeley's greenhouse gas uh, inventory and as expected, there was no description of food emission. This is because like many other cities, Berkeley was only following production-based greenhouse gas inventory. This inventory looks at emissions from goods and services that are produced only within the city limits. Meaning if I'm consuming a food in the city of Berkeley that was produced outside the city limit, then production-based inventory was not going to account for it. Like many other US cities, Berkeley don't produce its food locally. And so that's why all the food emissions in the city of Berkeley were actually going unaddressed. And so that's why I looked at city of Berkeley's consumption-based greenhouse gas inventory that was developed by Cool Climate Network in UC Berkeley. And this inventory actually showed us that the food emission in the Berkeley was actually higher than our energy sector, as well as it was higher than the vehicle vehicles direct fuel emissions. Majority of these food emissions were actually associated with meat and dairy consumption. In the Berkeley, recently we have banned natural gas in new building construction, but emissions from meat alone was actually exceeding the natural gas emission. So it was very clear by looking at this uh, consumption-based inventory that we needed to actually shift our food system towards plant-based food. The question was, how much shift is actually required as a necessary first step? As many of you know, we have only six to 11 years worth of carbon budget left before exceeding 1.5 C global warming. And so that's why recent UN reports are asking us to cut 45% of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. According to University of Michigan's recent report, 50% plant-based shift that actually focuses on a beef reduction, here as shown in the scenario four, can actually reduce US food emissions by 51%. This definitely aligns with the UN recommendations. And as a result, in order to implement this recommendation from University of Michigan, we designed a resolution of Vision 2025 for city of Berkeley. It asked the city to replace 50% of animal-based food with plant-based options in city's food procurement by 2025. It also asked the city to form an advisory body that can oversee the implementation of Vision 2025 and similar sustainable food programs. I remember after work, I would directly go to the city council uh, and speak during the um, public comment section to talk about Vision 2025. And then next day, I would actually take photographs and videos and then post it on social media, tagging my council members. This strategy really helped us get attention from our council, but it certainly did not actually help us find the right council member who was ready to sponsor Vision 2025. And so that's why I ended up diversifying my strategy. I mainly focused on meeting council members during their office hours, as well as scheduling one-on-one -on -one meeting um, with them to talk about Vision 2025. After all of this effort, we actually found our champion. Um, Berkeley Council member Cheryl Davila actually sponsored Vision 2025. Um, and then at the same year, she was also running for re-election as well. So we supported her campaign. Unfortunately, she did not win the election in 2020, but she still actually helped us pass Vision 2025 in the Berkeley. Not only that, but in her own life, she actually implemented a similar plant-based shift and now she rarely eats meat. Um, also, right before voting on the Vision 2025, Berkeley mayor admitted the strong connection between animal agriculture, climate change, and animal cruelty. And so this was a huge victory for us. 
And soon after adopting Vision 2025, Berkeley Council also committed to bringing this 50% shift by a year earlier, by 2024, and also checking a feasibility to serve 100% plant-based meals in city-governed facilities. Now, these are all the non-binding resolutions. It is like setting a goal. So in order to implement these commit commitments in the city of Berkeley, we actually designed a food procurement ordinance. This ordinance requires city to replace red and processed meat with healthy and sustainable plant-based food. It also requires city to prohibit animal products sourced from factory farming. Right now, we are advocating for this uh, policy in the Berkeley. Um, now, it's really important to bring plant-based shift in cities food procurement. But we want to actually see this kind of a plant-based shift happening across the Berkeley community. But we unfortunately can't mandate uh, uh, Berkeley resident to actually engage in a sustainable food consumption. So that's why here we can actually leverage the education. So we design public education ordinance. It requires the city of Berkeley to establish a public education campaign on plant-based nutrition that focuses on the benefits of environmental health, public health, as well as the animal health. Right now we are advocating for public education ordinance as well in the city of Berkeley. And I'm hopeful that soon we will find a council member to actually sponsor this item. Lastly, Berkeley Council um, or, or City of Berkeley uh, actually provides retirement benefits to their public um, employees through a state agency called CalPERS. After reviewing CalPERS investment portfolio, I found out that the state agency invests nearly $679 million into global factory farming companies. These companies also actually include Brazilian meat giants that are associated with Amazon deforestation. And so I designed um, a resolution of CalPERS factory farming divestment. Last year, Berkeley Council uh, passed this resolution and became the first city in the California to call CalPERS to divest from factory farming companies and instead invest, consider investing in California's local plant-based economy that promises good return on the investment along with creating more green jobs right here in the state of California. In summary, we are actually focusing on three main policy areas in the Berkeley, food procurement, community education, as well as cities investment. And we are addressing it by first of all, having Berkeley Council pass Vision 2025. We are also actually advocating um, um, to Berkeley School Board um, for adopting Vision 2025 as well. We already passed CalPERS uh, factory farming divestment in the Berkeley, and now we are advocating for procurement ordinance as well as public education ordinance. There's a one more policy that we are advocating right now. We are asking Berkeley Council to actually endorse plant-based treaty. As many of you know, uh, it is an international treaty that actually puts plant-based food at the center of climate change movement. Plant-based treaty already has drafted resolution, so it should be fairly easy for Berkeley Council to endorse the plant-based treaty. Now, all of this work in the Berkeley won't be able to actually produce a significant impact on our food system in the United States if the rest of the other cities won't step up and enact plant-based policies. And so that's why at Cultivate Empathy for All, right now our main focus is to mobilize local activists in order for them to engage in steady advocacy for passing plant-based food policies. We have already uploaded our policy templates on our website, so anyone can actually directly send the policy templates to their council members. We are also partnering with other organizations in order to develop a program, in order to develop a training program um, to empower local activists to engage in city advocacy. So that's why if you are interested in participating and advocating for plant-based food policies in your city, please contact me at nilang at cultivateempathyforall.org. Um, I want to end this presentation um, with a hopeful note by putting a spotlight on Los Garros plant-based advocates. These are grassroots activists 
Um, and they have really helped pass Green Monday in the town of Los Gatos. When we actually look at this kind of a city plant-based advocates, um, and, and when, when we are learning about this kind of a change maker, it often makes us think how our food system would look like in the United States if most US cities had advocates supporting plant-based policies. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Nalan. Yes, you have to love those grassroots organizers, organizations, movements. Um, they are putting in the work on the ground, which is very important. Without them, you know, we wouldn't have anything. And yes, I endorse the plant-based treaty. <laughs> and everyone, everyone watching should do. All right, we have an, an, another amazing panelist, um, the grandson of Iowa farmers. John Gibb Millspaw holds a Master of Divinity and Master of Public Administration, graduating from Harvard Divinity School and Harvard's Kennedy School in 2001. He's award, his award-winning justice work has focused on modern slavery, LGBTQ, LGBTQ, I'm sorry, rights, climate justice, and farmed animals. John's thoughts on social ethics have been featured in the Boston Globe and the Orange County Register, C-SPAN, the San, San Diego Union Tribune, and the Los Angeles Times. A resident of San Diego, California, John has made progress on shifting local school districts, the city and the county to more plant-based foods. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for having me. I've learned a lot from the other panelists so far. Um, I'm here to talk about my experiences working in San Diego, trying to pass more plant-based food policies. A lot of that work has been through the Good Food Purchasing Program. I am the uh, co-chair of the Good Food Purchasing Program working group of the San Diego Food System Alliance. And I do that work in my role as the director of education at Farm Forward. I'm assuming you're seeing my slides. Is that Right, okay, good. So I'm gonna talk about my work with San Diego school districts and the city and county of San Diego. Uh, a lot of that work is focused on the Good Food Purchasing Program, which looks at institutional food pro procurement. So like other panelists today, this is not so much about individuals' food choices, it's about institutions, schools, hospitals, cafeterias. Why do we focus on institutions? Well, for example, school districts spend millions of dollars on food every year. And when institutions shift toward more plant-based foods that profoundly impacts environmental sustainability and animal welfare. So what is GFPP? It was mentioned earlier. I'm gonna go into some more depth. It's a values-based food procurement program. We help institutions shift their thinking about how to evaluate what food to buy. So institutions are used to asking, are ingredients affordable? Are ingredients tasty? Are they visually appealing? Are they culturally appropriate? And all of those questions are important. And we help institutions also ask whether their food purchases prioritize the health and well-being of people, animals, and the environment. So in addition to the usual criteria that institutions think about when procuring food, we help them think about five value areas. What are those values? Nutrition, environmental sustainability, local economies, valued workforce, and animal welfare. I love participating in GFPP because it's a coalition where all of those values are on the table and all of them are not just words, but they're measurable using metrics to see how, uh, how well an institution is doing on those uh, various areas. So today I'm gonna to focus on animal welfare. And as was mentioned earlier, one of the ways that GFPP measures progress toward animal welfare is how much an institution shifts from animal-based products to plant-based products. Often institutions have financial concerns about adopting GFPP. They worry that shifting toward these value areas in their procurement will increase their costs. But thanks to shifting from animal-based food to plant-based food, costs are often in fact lowered. 
So there's an extra incentive for institutions to shift from animal-based to plant-based foods, saving money. So how does GFPP work? Here's an example. The local GFPP working group that I co-chair approaches a school district's food service director and gets their interest. The district then agrees to do a baseline assessment with the Center for Good Food Purchasing, which is the nonprofit that exists to, to support GFPP. That initial evaluation measures where the school district's food dollars are going now and how their current food products and suppliers align, align with GFPP standards. Then we help the district set goals for each of the five value areas. Those goals and their associated metrics get incorporated into formal district policy and into requests for proposals and contracts. After a year or two or three, the center measures the school district's progress toward meeting their goals and we celebrate their successes. So that's how it works in theory. In practice, here's what's happened in San Diego with GFPP. We approached six or seven school districts in San Diego County and found that their interest varied considerably. All of them were willing to meet with us. And after our presentation, some said, yeah, let's keep talking. And some said that they didn't want to keep talking. Two that did want to keep talking, one was Escondido Union and the other was Oceanside Unified. They have both now officially adopted GFPP. And here's where it gets tricky because of COVID. As you probably know, schools changed the food that they served significantly because of the pandemic. So even though these two districts officially adopted GFPP during COVID and completed their baseline assessments, each school district now wants to do baseline assessments that measure how well they do on a non-COVID year, which we're still waiting for. So we're in conversation about redoing the baseline assessment for each district. After that's done, each district will set goals and go about implementation. And this will have a profound effect in San Diego because Escondido Union School District and Oceanside Uni Unified School District have a combined annual food spend of nearly $7.3 million on more than 5.6 million meals served annually at more than 50 schools. So their shift into the five GFPP value areas will make a substantial difference for the region. So as we're working here in San Diego, we're part of this larger network of GFPP working across the country. It's grown a lot over the past six years. We now work in 24 cities and over and, and in 10 states plus Washington DC. In total, we're working with 60 institutions, uh, which includes school districts, hospitals, universities, and municipal agencies for parks, aging, homeless services, emergency feeding, juvenile detention and jails, among others. In total, the Good Food Purchasing Framework impacts over 1.1 billion in annual food purchases. Notable adopters include cities like Los Angeles, Boston and Chicago, as well as Cook County, San Francisco City and County and Alameda County. And we're working on the County of San Diego as well. Here is how. San Diego County is governed by a five member board of supervisors and has uh, annual $20 million in food spend on 10 million meals served annually. So the county is the heavy hitter when it comes to local food procurement. We heard through the grapevine that at the request of one of our county supervisors, Tara Lawson Reamer, when funds were coming down through the federal relief COVID relief legislation, the America Rescue Plan Act of 2021, or ARPA, we heard that the supervisors wanted to set aside 1 million of that ARPA funding to make county food procurement more sustainable. So they created a task force to investigate what sustainable food procurement would look like. And we tried to engage with that task force, but they shut us out and they deliberately shut out every other outside influence as they developed their recommendations to present at a January 25th, 2022 Board of Supervisors meeting. So since we couldn't influence the task force, we decided to influence the Board of Supervisors meeting. I met with one of Supervisor Lawson Reamer's deputies, Amanda Berry. Uh, so Tara Lawson Reamer was our champion in, in government and Amanda Berry helped us figure out what we could do to be helpful. 
She said that having people speak at the meeting and having two to four letters sent to the supervisors in advance of the meeting would be helpful. So that's what we did. Um, I worked with Ellie Brown of the San Diego Food System Alliance in getting 14 organizations depicted here to sign a letter to the Board of Supervisors. I also wrote an interfaith clergy letter that was signed by 14 clergy from throughout the county of various denominations and faiths. Then Ellie and I organized people to testify at the January 25th supervisors meeting. We had five speakers, all asking the Board of Supervisors to expand their definition of what value-based procurement means. As a result, the county allocated the 1 million to shift the food it serves toward environmental sustainability, local and valued workforce, three of the five GFPP value areas. While the county has not yet explicitly adopted nutrition or animal welfare as a goal, the stage has been set and the county will soon consider a proposal to adopt GFPP and the Center for Good Food Purchasing as its partner in implementation. So it was a partial victory and we hope it's a milestone on the path to San Diego County's GFPP adoption. Finally, I want to mention the city of San Diego, which I've been working with not through GFPP, but on just shifting to plant-based. The city has been rewriting its climate action plan. And as a Farm Forward staff member, I've engaged the climate action plan's public feedback mechanisms for about a year, along with the Better Food Foundation's executive director, Jennifer Channon. We both met personally with the city's climate action plan program coordinator, helped to engage a coalition campaign with 20 community groups, participated in a couple feedback sessions, signed a letter and solicited hundreds of community comments. Jennifer also successfully placed an op-ed on the topic in the San Diego Union Tribune newspaper. As a result, the city updated its draft climate action plan, as you can see here in the last line of the pictured text, to include a 20% reduction in meat and dairy related emissions and water footprints. In my most recent meeting with the city's climate action plan program coordinator, she said that we were directly responsible for this meat and dairy reduction goal. So that's a significant victory that we'll need to follow up on uh, with implementation in the years ahead. So I wanna end by thanking you for the work that you are doing in your part of the world, uh, may, or maybe just planning to do, or even just imagining at this point, you can change a school district, a city, a county, our world. Don't hesitate to be in touch with me at Farm Forward. If you have any questions, here is my email address. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, and congratulations to Farm Forward on their success with the GFPP program. And shout out to Jennifer Channon. I know her very well. She works very hard. Thank you. Uh, moving right along, we have our next pan panelist, uh, Claudia Lifton, uh, works for the Institute for Humane Education. She spent the last six years speaking to students, businesses, and stakeholders about the impacts of industrial animal agriculture with the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. She's a board member of Good Life Animal Refuge. As a member of the Community Adaption Resiliency and Environmental Justice Committee of the Denver Mayor Sustainability Advisor Council. She successfully passed a plant forward policy that will be applied at all council events. Previously, she traveled throughout Africa and Southeast Asia working with locals to address concerns ranging from poaching, shark finning, overfishing, water access, animal tourism, exploitation, and wildlife trafficking. She spent three summers working at Catskill Animal Sanctuary in New York, helping to run their camp kindness. Welcome, Claudia. It's all yours. Hello. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome, okay. Yes, thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Claudia Lifton. Uh, I'm so honored and excited and a little intimidated to be here today speaking alongside such incredible, inspiring activists. I 
I'm just so moved by all that you have shared and, and feeling so hopeful and excited. Um, so I now work for the Institute for Human Education, which is an organization that helps teachers educate about human rights, environmental protection, and animal protection. And I have previously worked uh, for other animal protection groups, such as Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, Catskill Animal Sanctuary, Global Vision International, and PETA. But some of the most gratifying, exciting, and impactful work I've done has been off the clock, such as starting the very first spay and neuter clinic uh, on a small island of Fiji, conducting undercover investigations of bear bile farms in Laos, and rescuing this very clingy baby macaque from wildlife traffickers in Southeast Asia. Now living in Colorado, I serve on the board of Good Life Refuge where my foster chicken, Sweet D here now resides. Shout out to any Always Sunny fans out there. Uh, and I also lobby legislators on behalf of HSUS and Colorado voters for animals in my spare time. Anyone out there looking for work in the animal protection movement, just know that you don't have to work for an animal protection organization to have a massive impact for animals. And that leads me to some of the most impactful work I've done throughout my career as a member of the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Council. So in late 2020, the Denver Climate Action Sustainability and Resiliency Office uh, invited the public to apply to join one of the six committees of the Sustainability Advisory Council to help guide the implementation of Denver's climate change focused policies and programs. My very first lesson in working with government is that things move incredibly slowly because after a while I had assumed that I wasn't chosen. Uh, but finally, about four and a half months later, I found out that I had been selected to join my top choice of committees, which was the Community Adaptation, Resiliency and Environmental Justice Committee. But since really no one can ever remember the full name of the committee, including the members ourselves after almost a year and a half, I will just be referring to it as CareJ. Uh, so the role of CareJ is to advise CASER on prioritizing strategies, policies, and programs that support and empower residents and communities to foster systemic changes necessary to eliminate air pollution, including carbon emissions and associated pollutants, and to prepare for and adapt to climate change impacts. Unsurprisingly, none of the committees prioritized food in their mission or description, but the CareJ committee did seem like my best bet in getting food to be a part of the conversation. Right after our staff liaison or the CareJ committee staff liaison, who also happens to be the executive director of the CASER office, sent out the contact information of all of the committee members to one another, I reached out to them right away. I set up a time to buy them all a cup of coffee. I ended up volunteering at a few of their own organization's events, donated to their fundraisers, even sent dinner to one of my fellow committee members who had sustained an injury. I also volunteered for anything the Sustainability Advisory Council needed. If another one of the committees needed an outsider to sit in on a meeting, I was the first to raise my hand. Need a note taker, I'm your girl. When COVID restrictions lifted, I was the first to offer up my apartment as a place for everyone to gather in person. It was really, really important to me to build mutual trust and, and respect with my fellow committee members before bringing up my own personal priorities to them. Meeting people where they are and tapping into their passions to drive them to action rather than pushing your own agenda on them is really the best advice that I can offer in this work. So in getting to know our uh, staff liaison, who again is the executive director of the CASER office, I wanted to learn more about what her priorities were to see where they might overlap with mine. So we were working well together and it did feel like the right time to bring up that I would like to see the Sustainability Advisory Council prioritize food as a way for individuals and institutions to have a positive impact on the environment. I told her that I want Denver, I want my city to become a pioneer in the fight against climate change by serving climate friendly plant forward foods by default at city events. So she mentioned 
or she recommended that I draft a policy that would apply to caster sponsored events only to set an example for other agencies and said that while the caster office was hesitant to require plant-based foods only at their events, they were more than happy to require a plant-based option. And thus is the brilliance of Better Food Foundation and the impactfulness of default veg. So with Laura, the wonderful woman who put on this whole event with her help and the help of the folks at BFF, we drafted the following policy. For all of its events and meetings, Denver's Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency, or CASER, commits to serve plant-based meals by default, giving diners the choice to opt into meals with animal products. Plant-based defaults are an enormously effective way to reduce our water, land, and carbon footprints while being inclusive of all dietary needs and protecting diner choice. Crucially, through this commitment, CASER will model and help usher in a shift towards more sustainable eating in our community. To meet this food policy, CASER will make plant-based entrees the default option for catered meals, put plant-based entrees at the beginning of the menu or buffet, and offer at least two plant-based options for every one meat option. My next step was uh, proposing the policy and giving a Better Food Foundation presentation to my fellow CARIJ committee members during our monthly call. And then I also gave the same, or proposed the policy and gave a presentation to the other committee members during their monthly calls. Once I had the endorsement of all of the members of all seven committees, I presented the policy to the members of the Sustainability Advisory Council during their all staff call, and they voted to officially make the recommendation to the CASER office. Here we can see one of the three plant-based options that was served at the very first in-person event held by the CASER office in November, 2021. While getting this policy passed is a big win, it is definitely not the finish line. As it stands now, this policy applies to CASER catered events only. But my hope and what I dream about every night and daydream about every day is to get some uh, variation of default veg language included into the executive order, which is known as the XO-123, which is the sustainability policy issued by the mayor that governs all city agencies and will be signed later this year. The plant-based default language will be bundled in with lots of other sustainability initiatives, including composting initiatives, as well as limits on plastic water bottles and single-use plastics. So they're still hammering out the details. And there is some concern that some of the more conservative agencies won't agree to it. but I will keep doing my best to win them over. And you know, this work requires passion, persistence, and patience. But like all of you, I am committed to doing whatever it takes to creating a more just, sustainable, and humane food system. Thank you all so much for your time. It was such an honor to speak here today. Thank you, Claudia. Yes, passion, persistence, patience, building relationships, meeting people where they are. And that's exactly uh, the model. So congratulations on that work. Thank you. Congratulations to everyone. Hey, there you go, Laura. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists and to Naja for moderating. This has been really amazing. And I know we're already past the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and end um, just to be respectful of everyone's time. We have a couple of questions that weren't answered. I think we mostly answered everything in the chat uh, for the most part. But again, like I said, we'll be sending out an email probably by tomorrow that will contain everyone's contact information for the panelists, um, Some definitely some really great tools for you all as well as a link to sign up as a default badge ambassador if you like to kind of model the work that Claudia is doing in your own community and help usher in this new plant-based sustainable default. Um, yeah, so with that, look out for that email. Also, the recording will be there in case you missed something or came late. And um, thank you all so much for all the work you're doing and um, good luck to you and get in touch if you need help or resources or wanna connect. Thank you all again.